better than last year when we were all virtual and today i want to share a little bit about my company he medics you know us as a pioneer in patient blood management and we've certainly strive to continue to be innovative and emerge as one of the leaders in patient blood management in the world today last year we actually celebrated our 50th anniversary as a company. It was probably a little low key because we weren't in person in very many places, but for all of you, it means that during your entire career as perfusionists or other clinicians, Hemanetics has been with you for your entire career. So we were founded by Jack Latham in 1971, and he lived in the Boston area. There's a lot of startups, as you know, in the Boston area. And he actually invented the disposable Latham Bowl in 1968 and then founded the company in 1971. And he was driven by a vision to improve the safety and quality of the world's blood supply. And that's all hemanetics is still about today. We are all blood, all of the time. Every one of our products has to do with the safe uh, acquisition of blood, collection of blood and plasma, the safe storage, the safe distribution in hospitals, and of course, where possible, the prevention of unnecessary blood transfusions by the use of things like cell saver. And if you heard Dr. Morant's talk yesterday, you heard him talk about the use of TEG as a way to reduce the use of allogeneic blood in his hospital, Toledo Hospital. So the blood supply, maintaining blood supply, uh, safe blood supply, high quality blood is all about what we are at Hemanetics. So you can imagine the concern that we had when the American Red Cross declared a national blood crisis in mid-January. Now, we'd been monitoring the situation all throughout the pandemic, and interestingly, there is not one central point of information for the status of the nation's blood supply at any time. And it's you know typical of the United States, it's about the free market, people's willingness to donate blood, their ability, they have to be healthy enough, of course, to donate blood, and it has worked well for decades and decades, right up until mid-January. Um, so we have a scientific advisory council, and some of them are leaders of blood banks at large hospital systems in the United States. And even at the beginning of the pandemic, they were expressing their concern, their fear that there might be a blood shortage in the United States and, in fact, around the world. So it's something we monitored. And New York Times actually broke a story in June of last year talking about the emerging blood crisis. And there were multiple stories through the fall, right up until we heard the ARC make this declaration. And it's something we really took to heart because the mission of why we're around is about blood. And if, if you heard John McCaskill's talk yesterday, he talked about start with your why. Remember, he talked about his why as a Navy SEAL. And our why is about the safe collection, storage, distribution, and use of blood in helping patients and helping hospitals. So let's look a little bit deeper about how this crisis happened. There's always fluctuations in the supply of blood in the United States, but we had forces that were acting on both the supply side and the demand side. So let's talk about the supply side. So uh, as everybody quarantined in the early days of the pandemic, of course, uh, blood collections plummeted. And about 25% of the blood collected in the United States is from high school and college students. So when high schools went to remote learning and colleges went to remote learning, they canceled all the blood drives. And they really haven't rebounded at the pre-pandemic levels. And blood collections haven't rebounded to pre-pandemic levels. So there's been a struggle to rebuild the blood supply. On the demand side, I think it's first important to understand well, what is the demand for blood in the United States. So again, according to American Red Cross, Every two seconds, someone in this country needs blood or platelets. And in the course of a year, there are 16 million units of blood transfused in this country. And if we look at a daily rate, there's 29,000 units of red blood cells, 6,500 units of plasma, and 5,000 units of platelets. So that's the typical demand daily and annually in the United States. 
So the other forces acting on the demand side, um, it's starting in about mid-2021, and you all know this very well, uh, there is a rebound on elective surgeries. So if you think back to the early days of the pandemic, some of you might have been sitting at home because cases were getting canceled and only the most emergent ones were finally being scheduled. So we started to see more regular patterns of surgeries in the middle of last year, and that continued into the beginning of this year. And in some cases, if patients waited, they were sicker by the time they got their surgery and they may have needed more blood than had the surgery occurred on its original time schedule. In addition, very regrettably, there was a double digit increase in the numbers of traumas in the United States. And some of that was, again, people going from being quarantined to, I am vaccinated, I'm gonna get on a plane, I'm gonna get in my car. And unfortunately, there's a lot more penetrating traumas as well as other people got out and about. So both of these things, both of these sets of forces were acting and it really put things out of balance in our blood supply in this country. And all of a sudden, this became the image in the blood bank. Empty bins and empty shelves. Um, this is from a large hospital system in the United States where um, almost every shelf is empty. There's more empty shelves than full shelves. And um, again, a lot of empty bins. So in mid-January, the reason the crisis was declared is uh, type O blood, which in a blood bank is about three to five days of supply, went to less than half a day. So some really hard decisions had to be made about who was going to get that blood, which surgeries, did we have the right blood to cross match to the patient, um, did we need to save that half day of type O blood for trauma patients that might come through the ED doors that particular day. So a really dire set of circumstances that were just unprecedented really since the establishment of what we currently have as the American blood supply. And so you can imagine at Hemonetics, if we're all blood all the time and we care deeply and passionately about patient blood management, you know, we did a lot uh, to do more messaging about the use of our products because we have the privilege of being able to benefit both the demand side and the supply side. So on the demand side, you're all so familiar with Cell Saver that can help to give a patient their own blood, the best kind of transfusion there is. And uh, Teg, you, if you heard Dr. Morant's talk, he talked about the importance of a Teg system as part of a patient blood management program. And he talked about the, signif the significant reduction of every blood component in his hospital system, Toledo Hospital, since the use of Teg 5000 11 years ago. On the supply side, should a patient need to have donor blood, we are with you every step of the way. So MCS stands for Mobile Collection System. That is our blood collection system. Uh, PCS is a plasma collection system. So we collect whole blood, we have blood apheresis, and we have plasmapheresis. And then, should it make its way to the hospital, something you may not be as familiar with, we have two products that help with that, SafeTrace TX and BloodTrack. So SafeTrace TX is a blood bank information system. It is what is used to manage the blood in the blood bank, and it connects with the hospital information system, things from Epic and Cerner and Allscripts. BloodTrack is a point of care blood management system. So it's also software. It works with SafeTrace and other types of software. And there's a hardware component to it as well. There are refrigerators for the storage of blood components. And it works a little bit like a Pixis system, but for blood components. So uh, an authorized employee can go and get the blood that's been in blood components that have been prescribed by a physician, deliver them safely. They're stored at the right temperature. They're cross-matched to the patient. Um, and again, every step of the way from collection to distribution, Hemonetics has a role in that. But it's not enough to rebalance the scales. We actually have to tip them more. Ideally, uh, supply is more than demand. And so it's a really great moment for me to take some time and appreciate all of you in your role as perfusionists. Uh, the work that you do every day in ORs in the United States and throughout the world absolutely make a difference in making sure that patients first get their own blood back. Um, and if needed, there, a lot of you run TEG and other viscoelastic testing machines, and you help to assure that the right component gets to the right patient in the right quantity and at the right time. So in closing, I think back over the innovation that Hemonetics has delivered 
in the last five decades. And we have a very robust pipeline where we have new product development, product improvements, and clinical studies that are all in process across that whole portfolio I told you about, from blood collection and plasma collection, the software products, Cell Saver, as well as TAG. And I really look forward to sharing that with you at a future Sanibel Symposium. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eva. Our next speaker is Jim Kamsa from Cytosorb. He is the Vice President of Sales and Marketing. Hello, I am uh, Jim Kamsa. Sorry. Put it in presentation mode. Mm, maybe not. There it goes. Hi, uh, I'm Jim Kamsa. I'm the uh, Vice President of Sales and Marketing at Cytosorbents. And, uh, I do uh, appreciate the work you do, and uh, I really uh, appreciate the chance to give you an overview of our company and our products and why we're here. Um, and thank you again to Profusion.com and Carla for putting on a nice intimate meeting like this so we can share these ideas and thoughts. Um, if we go back 10 years, Cytosorbents was a relatively small company. It had about 20 employees. We were funded by some grants, DARPA grant, military grant, NIH grant, to study blood purification and some of the applications of that. Um, originally, it was a, like a think tank, and uh, these projects took, take a long time to get to market. Um, the outcome of, of some of these have resulted in products that are launched over in Europe or outside the US, and we have a couple of things here as well. but. Um, one of them is a, is a polymer, and I'll show you exactly what that is. Oop, I'm sorry. Um, this, is, this is one of our cartridges. You can see it out on the, on the floor over there, but uh, inside it is a, a uh, I would say it's a, a, a biocompatible, highly biocompatible porous polymer bead that acts like a tiny sponge to absorb different molecules of different sizes and hydrophobicity. Uh, the image on the left is just a, one of our cartridges cut in half, so it's packed with the polymer. The second image is showing the blood flows upward through it. Um, that third image is a bead itself, and the bead is, uh, they're round, they're about the size of a grain of sand, and the image on the far right is a very close-up of the surface of inside one of these beads. So um, it, while they're very small and it's a small 300 ml cartridge, it has a surface area of seven football fields. So it's very effective at absorbing molecules. Uh, from a perfusionist perspective, leveraging the technology is very straightforward. Uh, it's plug and play on most systems in hospitals that you are familiar with, um, dialysis or CRRT, ECMO, hemoperfusion, or a cardiac, cardiopulmonary bypass. If you jump forward to um, today, fast forward, we are a publicly traded company on NASDAQ. Our ticker symbol is CTSO. We have 230 employees and growing every day. Um, we've been on Deloitte's technology Fast 500 company for multiple years in a row, and uh, we're just building out a brand new facility in Princeton, New Jersey, much larger, I would say five times as large, to accommodate some of the rapid growth that's coming. 
the current technology is used in 70 plus countries, but in the US, it's really a tale of two products. The first one is Cytosorb. Um, and some of you may have heard of that, but we have an emergency use uh, authorization for critically ill adult COVID patients with eminent respiratory distress. Um, Dr. Hyanga spoke of it, others have spoken on it already. Um, and uh, it, under the EUA, cytosorbins can, it can become available for a very specific set of uses, um, but Typically, it is, this is the more detailed EUA that comes with it. If you're interested in that, we can get that to you at our booth. Um, Cytosorb's emergency use authorization is defined, you know, it's for acute lung injury, uh, severe disease defined as, and you can read through this, life-threatening diseases, um, septic shock, multi-organ failure, but typically um, you'll see it, it has been used in about 50 accounts here in the U.S. Uh, hospitals, and the, as Dr. Hyanga said, the results of our CTC registry were quite compelling, increasing survival when selected on the right patients and used at the right time. Uh, I'll, I'll, I won't go into all the detail here, but you have a number of uh, hyperinflammatory um, or inflammatory mediators like ferritin, C-reactive protein, IL-6, the cartridge can absorb and reduce the levels of those, reducing the inflammation. And uh, we've seen common findings are inflammatory mediator reduction, reversal of shock and weaning off vasopressors, and objective improvement in lung function. Uh, I will not go into too much detail here because Dr. Hyanga already discussed it, but this was a multi-center uh, registry that was published, and we saw survival of 73% versus around 50% on a much larger ELSO registry. If we continue to look at 2022 and focus on a, another product, it's Drugzorb. You'll see out uh, on the floor a Drugzorb display. Um, we have two breakthrough, and Drugzorb is based off of a similar technology, but a little bit different configuration of a system. We have two breakthrough device designations, two pivotal uh, randomized clinical trials, and, um, and they are called star T and star D. I'll get into that in a little more detail. Uh, we have the actual rationale and design of the trial paper out on the floor if you're interested in it. Uh, if you think your facility might be interested in exploring this, um, what these are are called the safe and timely antithrombotic removal of ticagrelor. So star T and star D is similar but for DOAX. So, we already know from some use of similar technology outside the U.S. that it is, it is a very effective remover of these drugs. And in patients that are undergoing urgent or emergent cardiac surgery, real time in, placed into the CPB circuit, you can remove the drugs theoretically reducing bleeding complications and providing some economic benefit. But that, these are not available in the U.S. yet, and uh, the trial has to bear out those results. A uh, JCS published a study out of Canada that identified bleeding risk as the most significant consideration when performing cardiac surgery on patients loaded with ticagrelor. Uh, the authors concluded that ticagrelor bleeding complications were a major concern and recognized a significant unmet clinical need. We've heard similar data from around the world and feedback and in the U.S. as well. So we're, we're quite anxious to get these underway. The drugsorb timing. Uh, looking forward, while we're all, we are already enrolling, uh, but we are still recruiting centers and investigators. If interested, we can put you in touch with our clinical research team. We're looking for the interim results 
This fall, with the START trial expected to wrap up by the end of the year, and the START D uh, trial would be wrapped up approximately a year later. That these are estimates based on enrollment rate. Again, Drugzorb is investigational and not available for sale in the U.S. at this time. So really, just to give you, to, to summarize here, our why is we, we were a small company funded by some research grants to look at different blood purification techniques. During the course of this research, we found several, uh, several that can be commercialized. Uh, we have a company that is publicly traded based on sales and results outside the U.S. In the U.S., you're available for EUA for COVID patients, and we have these two trials enrolled. So I, I really want to thank you for what you do. We appreciate the work you do, and Perfusion is a, is a critical part of how our products are used, and Perfusion has play a big role in that, so thank you. And uh, to Carla and the Perfusion.com team, we really appreciate these small meetings and the way we can form relationships, help patients, and bring these technologies to market. So thank you. Hey, Jim, we have one question sure. from Alyssa. Is there any research or any papers out there that shows the percentage that Cytosorb increases level of survival in a COVID patient? There's a C, the CTC registry is, was 50, is published at 52 patients, and it, it showed a result of 73% survival at 90 days. That is comparable to some larger databases from ELSO that show survival at about 50%. So there is a significant increase shown in that study. I think it was referenced earlier. That study has continued, or that registry, and there are now over 100 patients in, and the numbers are still the same. It's still over 70% survival. So pretty good results. Thanks. Thank you, Jim. Our next speaker is Courtney Novello. She is with Specialty Care. She is the Director of Operations, the South Atlantic Region. Courtney. slideshow. There we go. Maybe. Did I mess it up? Okay. Good afternoon, everybody um, that's here or at home. I'm actually really happy to be here. We haven't, I was thinking about this, haven't been in person at a meeting since I think 2019 at a Florida Perfusion Society meeting. Um, I've met many of you there helping put that meeting on. I was asked to get up here for specialty care by the ladies in the back, the recruiters, um, and talk about some of the great things that we have had going on. And in preparing this, I was kind of like, all right, I don't sell a product, but then again, I do. Um, I sell people and I sell our service. And so I'm just gonna go through a couple slides here. Um, this one says, what are the people saying? So in preparing for this, um, in my new role as a DO, I, I reached out to um, you know, my teams, some people that have been around a long time, a um, couple that were hired in the last year, and I wanted to know, what are you thinking? Because if you're not thinking what I'm thinking about the company, we need to talk. And um, I got some of the best responses. Um, you just wouldn't believe, and I just wanted to highlight a few. And, what um, my staff were saying about our company and saying, you know, everyone cares for and takes care of each other. Um, the next one I think is super important, access to an abundance of education and knowledge. And as a perfusion staffing company, um, 
you know, education and making them feel that, you know, they have someone to reach out to is really crucial. It says, uh, the next one, which I think is pretty funny, one of my area managers says, specialty care does not try to micromanage my accounts. My team has the freedom to manage day-to-day -day operations as we see fit. I think that's pretty funny and uh, that we're allowing them to do what they need to do in their accounts. I'm thankful for our wonderful supply chain team. Um, I have to say that as a company, we have been able to uh, make sure our teams have the products they need and we haven't canceled any cases due to pack shortages that everybody's experiencing. It may not be exactly what everybody's been used to, but we've been able to get something into those accounts. The last one says, specialty care has encouraged our team to continue to grow and use our strengths to better develop the service line and welcomes our input. These are just a few um, photos I found of uh, our great teams around. We aren't just a perfusion staffing company. We have other service lines. And so on here, there's some um, of the IONM folks. I have surgical assist folks, some of my ECMO specialists. And then um, the recruiters are on, the, on this picture on the, the end here. I just keep having to highlight them. Um, some of our service lines that you may not know we have besides perfusion, we have a very large interoperative neuromonitoring uh, service line across the country. We also provide surgical services that include sterile processing and helping the hospitals with that service line and also autotransfusion. Speaking of perfusion services, since this is a perfusion meeting, um, we are the market leader. We are in one of eight open heart procedures in the United States. We are accredited by the Joint Commission. Um, we have a huge database that Al helps manage, but has over 40,000 cardiac surgical cases in it, has over 1,000 ECMO cases and 65,000 ATS cases in order to help us um, do our quality reporting and standards for um, your hospitals. We're innovative in our field. We use um, that data to detect and diagnose any kind of outliers and help make changes so that our hospitals see um, what's, you know, what's going on. We're very open with our hospitals and if we need to make changes to something we're doing, we do it. Um, in clinical education, I talked about that already, we have a, a program to help our um, staff perfusionists move on up and keep going so that we can hire from within our company. And then I, w I wanted to throw this in here. This is my last slide. I'm going to give you guys back some time. But this is, you know, ECMO is huge. Um, you guys are seeing all the talks about ECMO. It's all of our world. Um, these are some of the ways that we've been partnering with um, hospitals lately and going in and either looking at the ECMO program that you already have going on and helping you tweak that, um, add things to it, provide education. We have turnkey where we can come in and do um, train ECMO specialists, train RNs. Um, one of the, the things that just started within the last couple months is a cannulation program. We're actually um, teaching the physicians to cannulate. Uh, we all know our physicians can cannulate, but when they want to bring it over to the cath lab, you know, maybe they need a little bit more education. So we've, we've partnered um, with a bunch of great ECMO people across the country to, to get all these different educations going on. If you have any questions about anything that we offer, um, if you're looking for a job, if you're, you know, anything, me, myself, Sarah, and Courtney, we will all be at the bar. Al, Alicia will all be at some bar within the next two days. Come up and ask us some questions, okay? Thank you. Thank you, Courtney. Is Dave DeWitt here? There you go. Our next speaker is Dave DeWitt with Medtronic. He is the Senior Product Director.
Hi, thank you. Uh, Dave DeWint it ha actually just had an emergency, so um, I'm going to take over for him here. Uh, my name is Neil Nye. I'm in Dave's organization in the, the, the global marketing team with, with Medtronic and extracorporeal therapies business. I lead the ECLS and perfusion marketing team. So I'm going to share uh, what Dave had, had planned. He just had an emergency come up, so I apologize for the, for the change. Thank you for your, your patience here as we, we make a, a pivot. Do I need a second? No. Oh, okay. It's coming up. Two more seconds to come up. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, apologies for the, the technical challenge here. Uh, I just want to just start off just talking a little bit about about Medtronic. Um, you know, we've 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 got a, a legacy that started in the in the late 1940s in a in a garage in, in Minneapolis, and our founder Earl Bakken had a dream, and you know, inspired by by Frankenstein, inspired by Popular Electronics magazine, he developed the the world's first uh, wearable. Um, pacemaker and you know starting off with a partnership with with Dr. Walt Lillehigh so our we have a, a long heritage in, in in cardiac surgery and years after that uh, we've we've had a, an enduring mission to alleviate pain restore health and extend life at its foundation but there's a lot more to it than than that and you know from that 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 first battery powered pacemaker to you know, everything else we have across the, the broader Medtronic organization, you know, our, our purpose and our foundational uh, mission is, is still the same today. And, you know, it doesn't just uh, in, inspire us just to, to, to show up every day and, and deliver the best products we can and best service and solutions, but just to show up and be extraordinary in, in everything that we deliver here. And, you know, to the point now where we're uh, impacting two patients every second of every hour of every day, you know, with our, our products across Medtronic. And we're really proud of that and, and wanting to, we can only do this with you, our healthcare providers, as our partners in, in this. It's, it's not something that we can, we can do without you. So we really appreciate the partnership. If I take a step back and just like look at like our, our cardiac surgery business here, you know, our, our vision and plan We've, we've got our, our therapies, and we've got all of the enabling pieces of it that fit into that extracorporeal therapies piece, whether it's our cannula, our oxygenators and reservoirs, and also we have the ECLS therapy that, that is where I'll focus mostly on today, talking about our extracorporeal life support, as that is, is becoming a, a big focus for us and our, and our energy investment in the extracorporeal therapies and the cardiac surgery business right now. And with uh, ECLS, you know, really just want to say that, that, that our mission is, is your mission. We want to, to be a, a partner and a comprehensive solution provider, and we've been building a pipeline of, of products, and, you know, we've been really proud to be able to be uh, delivering this, this cadence of, of new products as we've been moving along here. And part of this has been enabled just through our, our partnership with, with MC3. You know, this is, this is Bob Bartlett's... Uh, you know, baby in a, in a way, and, and they have some fantastic engineers and have developed the, the Nautilus Smart technology as well as, um, you know, the, the Crescent and Crescent RA cannula. And uh, we would love if you'd stop by the, our, our table tonight during the, the reception. We could, we could talk with you more about the details of these products. You know, at a, at a high level, really looking at you know, how do we provide that comprehensive solution across the entire portfolio here? And, you know, whether it's through vascular access, VV with dual lumen, or VA with, with single lumen, you know, building out um, different offerings there. We just uh, received clearance for our, our LS line of, of cannula, and we have those here on hand and planning on, on launching those here in the, in the coming months in the, in the U.S., Love for you to take a look at that and just see how they might fit into your practice. Um, first cannula indicated for both uh, long-term use and also for, for bypass. So a, a lot of flexibility and, and options with those cannula. 
and then also just all the support products, whether it's for, for gas exchange, uh, tubing packs, vascular access, and we also have patient monitoring there with, with invos, the cerebral monitoring, and, uh, and, and diagnostics as well. You know, there's been some conversations about HMS uh, during this, this show, and uh, we'd love to talk with you more about that in terms of your blood management strategies. So just getting into a few of the high-level details with, with some of the products here. For, for Nautilus Smart, you know, the best way to, to look at this is, is just, to, just to come by, stop by, and I'll talk with you personally uh, about um, the, the product here and the features and benefits and our design approach to the, this, this gas exchange module. You know, really a few different things here that we're, we're focused on, a lot of it really around just creating this circular flow path looking to improve long-term uh, gas transfer and, and durability. And we will, I would love to show you the, the details of that uh, with, the, with the product um, at, the, at, at the exhibit. Uh, the other thing with this that, we, that is a real differentiator is just the integrated monitoring for this. So if your aim is to have a simplified circuit um, and you want to have some of that fundamental information that's going to help you understand what's going on with your circuit and with your patient, you know, the sensors are, are built directly in to this gas exchange module. So, you know, if you can see the display on the bottom, the left side is, uh, are the, the, the venous um, measurements and on the right, the arterial. So pressure on both venous and arterial side with the delta calculated in the middle. So you can keep an eye on that pressure delta across your, your gas exchange module. And then the saturations inlet and outlet there as well. And across the top, you can see on the right there, there's the top right you know, green bar when everything is within the parameters that you want. And so you have the opportunity to set um, alarms wherever you would like or not have alarms on there. When it alarms, there's a tone and you'll see the gold light. So you know, during COVID, especially if you just wanted to look in a room, see if everything's okay, see the green light, you got your parameters set, um, then you don't necessarily have to just have that burden of, of being fully gowned going in and just to, to take a look at what the, the levels are there. Uh, so fully, fully, um, you know, customizable in terms of where you set your 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 limits and parameters on this one. Uh, going to the to the uh, vascular access side, you know, really excited about our our dual lumen cannula, um, both for the adult and pediatric side, the the crescent. You know, really come take a look at at the flow curves for this thing. Um, really exceptional flow on the on the product. Um, positioning is, is really improved with the tantalum markers on there. So, you know, if you're doing if you're doing a fluoroscope, you can see right away if if uh, the return is going into the RA. Um, so, and, and then the securement piece, uh, you know, a few different ways to attach this, make sure it's not going to rotate out of position. Um, just looking at you know where things were in the market before we we came in, and, and how do we take things to the next level and, and improve things and just. Uh, alleviate some of your, your concerns that you might have around um, just securement and, and rotation of, of a dual lumen cannula that's jugular access. And then uh, recently released a, a pediatric version of this, Crescent RA. Um, you can see that it has that right atrial design and just uh, you can see the image there where it just sits down for the, for the return. Um, really happy to, to be to have a product back in, in this part of the market for, for pediatric but a lot of the same features that we have on the on the adult size crescent with with really great flow for uh, the the catheter size and great securement on this and again you know the visualization being able to um, to, to see where the where the tip is and how it's positioned now with our biomedical life support, all of our, our single lumen cannula, uh, a lot of different options on here. You can see the ones with the, with the white caps on the, on the top. We call those a flex because you can use those both for drainage or return. So a couple of options to use for those. Um, we also have the, uh, the drainage cannula and, and also uh, return cannula, including the, the, the mini ones there. And so these are a full range that are approved and have two IFUs, one for ECLS and ECMO, and one for, for cardiopulmonary bypass. So a lot of flexibility in what you could do with, with this range of, of cannula in your practice. So with that, you know, really high level overview of where, we're, where we are right now with ECLS. Um, not really giving you uh, a lot of clues of where we're going, but really just wanting to say that, 
you know, we, we want to be your, your partner. We want to develop that full comprehensive solution for, for ECLS and uh, would love to, to talk with you one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you for the time. Appreciate your attention. Thank you. Our next speaker is with Fresenius Medical Care, Chris Pearson, VP of Marketing and Product Management. And for all the manufacturers, if you will go onto our live stream, we have people that are asking questions about your product. Some of them are requesting information about your product. Some of them are putting their emails down for you to be able to respond to them with specific questions. So when we finish, if you could go back in today's session and look at those comments and respond, that would be great. Thank you. <laughs> 